Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Friday, July 26th. This is such an important day in the world of Jill on Moneyland because today is Mark Talercio's birthday. So I'm just going to bring him on mic and say, happy birthday, Mark. How are you feeling, old man? Hello, Jill. Happy birthday. Yes, uh, July 26th, I turn 46. Oh my gosh. Uh, you crossed over, but you're not quite, you see, I feel like the 46, 47, 48, 48, those are very, they're sort of irrelevant birthdays. You know what I mean? Like the back half of a decade is always sort of like, eh, big deal, right? Uh, you haven't crossed into like a new age bracket for, uh, like, for example, when you turn 50 and you're like, oh, I will get a AARP uh, <laughs> solicitation or something. You know what I mean? So, uh, it's funny. But uh, happy birthday. I love you and you're the very, very best. And I'm so gra- grateful that you uh, share yourself with me. That just, is what I can tell you. Just think of this. When you and I started working together on a regular basis, I was 33 years old. I know. I remember. And you did not have a wife. You didn't nope. even have a glimmer of a wife. Nope. You had a lot of girlfriends. It's having a so, lot of fun in my little studio apartment in uh, Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Now, um, also today, very special day in honor of your birthday. Not really. We're doing a Friday focus. And I cannot believe how amazing the timing is because our topic is how elections impact markets. Okay. Now, gang, it has been like a fire hose of information over the last six weeks. And, you know, the one thing I want to remind everyone is that as much as The markets can move up and down day to day, week to week, month to month. Oh, the markets want this or investors want this. It's kind of baloney. First of all, these are short term trends. They're not long term trends. And I I cannot explain how difficult it is to try to extrapolate what's going on in politics day to day for how companies are going to make money long term. So the way that elections impact markets is that usually everyone's wrong and it's hard to imagine that, but it's kind of true. And uh, I'll never forget um, on the night of the 2016 election when it finally like like sort of everyone crossed over and said, oh, Trump's going to win. And then stocks plummeted in the overnight markets, plummeted. It looked like a full blown, like serious crash. And you know what happened? By the time everyone woke up in the morning, they were like, well, we don't really know what's happening. And then it all reversed. So we don't know what's going to happen. What I would like to say is that these are volatile times. Does not mean that that should impact your decision making. It means that sometimes when you're in a very volatile situation, you can actually go in the wrong direction because you are distracted from what's really at hand. So let's do some emails today. This is a question from CJ, and CJ's subject is, ready, doozy of a situation. So CJ says, I'm really excited to get your feedback on this. I am 57. My wife is 53. She stayed home and took care of our two kids. We have a pension, $84,000 a year, brokerage account of Oh my gosh, four and a half million dollars. Oh my God. Okay. There's a rollover IRA, 1.2 million and two fifty thousand dollar Roths. A relative passed away last year and left me a lot of UPS stock. And I mean a lot. With this stock in my brokerage account, it tilts my diversification at 84% in UPS stock and 16% in other stocks. My relative was all in with UPS. Boy, that's something. My rollover and my Roths are all in index funds. And obviously, I want and need to diversify the brokerage account. So this brokerage account is basically an inheritance. Crazy. Yeah. it's a, it's a And so just to be clear, again, this is a brokerage account of $4.5 million, guys. Okay? All right. Here's the big thought. From my relative's date of death cost basis, I am sitting with UPS stock at a capital loss of $682,000. Okay, so gang, let me just go through this a second. When somebody dies and leaves you stock, it's you don't get the person's cost basis that they accumulated. You get the cost basis on the date of death. That's like as if you bought the stock on the day that person died. So he's got whatever, $4 million that he bought in UPS stock. And right now, that stock has lost value of $682,000. 
here's the question now. I'm thinking it makes sense for me to sell a big chunk of the stock, like 75% and hang on to that capital loss for years to come. Then I'd reinvest the funds into something different that produced growth and dividends. My wife and I have created a budget just to live off my pension and dividends. It's got plenty of room and we're comfortable. Oh my gosh, kids are married, launch, blah, 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 no debt. House is worth $700,000. Okay, CJ, first of all, the one thing um, that I, I was laughing because I thought to myself, I thought you were going to ask me like, OK, now with the election or in the, the, is the tax law going to change? Should I do something different? So here is a very good idea for you. I love this concept where you sell. I, I don't know why we're even selling 75. I might sell the whole thing. You get six hundred eighty thousand dollars of capital loss. Now, why is this so important? OK, so today capital gains rates are really low. They really are, okay? Just remember that the long-term capital gains rate goes from zero to 23.8%. But, you know, one thing that's interesting, it's not just the election, but the political winds could change over your lifetime. You're a youngish guy, you know, you're in your 50s. But think about this. How valuable will those losses be if all of a sudden capital gains rates went back up to 28%? or went to 31% or, you know, so imagine how valuable those losses would be if you just had them and you would be able to actually use the, you could basically trade your account and just rebalance all the time. It wouldn't matter. I would take all those losses and, you know, you're going to make a clunker of a decision here or there and you'll be able to rebalance whenever like that. I would even say Mark, he could rebalance like, at least twice a year, maybe four, maybe quarterly, maybe that he should be doing quarterly rebalancing and he won't have to worry about it. I kind of love this, CJ. I like the idea. Okay. This is Sarah who writes, hi, Jill and Mark. First of all, I want to say I love your podcasts and your books. My question is about the 4% rule. I can't tell you how many articles I've read about this 4% rule. And uh, what they aren't specific about is a, is the 4% rule the amount that you can withdraw in retirement inclusive of the dividends and or interest you receive on your investments? Or is the 4% rule the amount you can take out of your capital each year and spend on top of the dividends interest you earn on your investments? I hope, hope, hope you choose this question because it's driving me nuts. Sarah turned 65, will turn 65 next year. She'll be retiring soon. She can't find anywhere that clarifies. Let's clarify this, Mark. Okay. A 4% rule, just to go back in time, the 4% rule is the amount that you can safely withdraw from a portfolio over time in retirement and hopefully not run out of money. And that does include inclusive of dividends and interest. It's not like you can take it on top of. It's all part of the same pot, okay? Now, the idea of 4% is a rule that essentially has been tinkered with over time. So uh, by the way, I was recently on Ask the Compound with uh, my friend Ben, you know, and we answered a question about this and I find it kind of interesting because like it kind of depends on like how risk averse you are. Like often you'll hear me say do three or three and a half percent. Ben put a chart up, which kind of blew my mind. It was essentially that like really the 4% rule does work. Very few people are running out of money pulling 4% out. So I think that that's something that you may want to think about. And if you'd like to read more, Ben Carlson is a great writer and he has a wonderful blog. He's also one of the hosts, but his blog is called A Wealth of Common Sense. Okay. So, um, you know, we're talking today on our Friday focus about how elections impact markets. And, you know, listen, elections do impact markets in that an administration can make tax policy front and center. They can also say, you know, but we don't know kind of like, is the tax situation more important than the tariff situation? Or we don't know kind of what's going to be the composition of the House and the Senate. And by the way, you're investing for a long, long period of time. And so four years is important, but it's not everything. So um, let's get to a question from Shannon, who wants to talk about capital gains and dividends. And we started the show talking about that because capital gains rates and dividends have changed over time. Right now, long-term capital gains rates are really low and dividends are just uh, taxed at your 
ordinary income tax rates. And so remember that the tax rate applies to a big bracket and marginal taxes are 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37. There we go. Uh, There are also some extra taxes that get thrown in. Sometimes this is for people who make more than $250,000 as joint filers or 200 as single filers, where you get an extra chunk of money that is taken out um, for Medicare. And sometimes it's for um, uh, a surtax on your investment income or your capital gains rates. So all these are factored in. Okay. Now let me get to Shannon's question. The question is, does this apply to holdings in brokerage accounts? In other words, holdings in 401ks and IRAs, they're not affected, right? Correct. That's perfect. That's exactly right. But any pre-tax money in those accounts obviously is going to be impacted by tax rates and brackets. And money that you take out of a Roth not taxed at all, which is why we love Roth so much. So I hope that helps you. And let's see. Okay. Here we have a question from Bill. Another reason to pay down the mortgage? An arm. Okay. Hi, Mark and Jill. I know the rule. You've got a 3% mortgage. Don't pay it down early. What if the mortgage is a seven-year adjustable rate mortgage? And the thought of this running out in 2027 makes me very uncomfortable. Maybe making those extra payments on the mortgage is better than getting a future refi that makes our monthly payment go way up. I'm freaking out a little bit. Everything else is in a good place financially. Thank you. You know, Bill, I think this really depends on where this extra money is coming from and what it's doing. So are you suggesting, again, you didn't give me the numbers, but let's just make this like you have a million dollar house and there's say three or 400 grand left on this And you're saying, I'm going to take money out of a brokerage account and pay it down and lose my liquidity. Is that the question? Is it I'm going to use cash flow to pay it down? I need to know more information. And if everything else is in a good place financially, maybe I would think that paying down a 3% mortgage over that time is worth it. But also, maybe what I would do is I would just invest the money because uh, 2027, it's not tomorrow, it's a few years maybe we would want to do something with that. Or maybe we would take money right now that you have and lock it up in a 5% CD for the next few years. I don't know, but I want to know so much more about you, Bill, because I think that that is something that's really, really important. Oh, I think I forgot one here. This is from Tim. This is a question about retirement assumptions. What's your opinion on investment return rate and inflation for future projections. I'm a do-it-yourselfer, spreadsheet nerd who's been retired several years. I used a 5% investment return for many years before retiring. I continue to use it. Well, things are looking pretty good for you. And Tim's brokerage account calculates the actual return and the 10 year has been 10.8%. Now, Tim's also been using a 3% inflation rate for living expenses and 1% for social social security cost of living adjustments. Hmm. I've also adjusted tax expense for required minimum distributions when we turn 73 in a few years. My strategy has been to project these numbers out more years than I plan to live, update the number regularly, and if it ever looked like our spending wouldn't be sustainable, we could reduce our spending or maybe my wife could go back to work. Don't send your wife back to work just yet. Okay, no crystal ball, just what you and Mark think about these assumptions. Okay, so here's what I like to do when I'm thinking about this. Here's the kind of assumptions I love to to consider. Um, So for example, like we're not talking about elections and markets and who's going to do what. Let's talk with what we know today. We know what the tax rate is today. And I would use today's tax rates. I really would because that's the only rate we know. Okay, next for investment returns. Maybe you're, if you've gotten a 10.8% average 10 year return, my guess is that you're sort of tilted towards like a 70 30 portfolio. You know, I still would rather, I, I don't know, I never use less than 6% unless someone's so wimpy. I don't know, Mark, I think 6% is fine. Maybe 6 or 7% would be fine. I think using an inflation rate of 3% is fine. And by the way, whatever you're using for inflation is exactly what you should use for your social security COLA because they are linked automatically. There's no need to do it separately, right? I don't think your wife has to go back to work. I think you're fine. 
I always use six and inflation. I always use three. You know, I, I kind of do a lot of these spreadsheets as well. So when I factor in inflation and dividend yield, the return usually comes out to around like 5.3 ish. All right. And so if you wanted to say after tax, like it's five, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. That's good. That's good for me. I feel good about that. Um, OK, Mark, that's it. That's the show. So it's your birthday show. Everybody send Mark a birthday greeting and uh, tell him how fabulous he is because he is. And if you've got a question for us, just go to jillonmoney.com, click the Contact Us button, let us know if you'd like to come on the air live with us. We'd love to have you. While you're there, sign up for the free weekly newsletter. And don't forget to subscribe to Jill on Money Live, where you have access to quarterly live webinars, bonus video content, all for the bargain basement price of 35 bucks. You can subscribe to us on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Please leave us a rating and review wherever you listen. It is Friday. We do not just do the our, our Friday focus, but we do our thanks. And we're so grateful for our music, which was composed by Joel Goodman, for the birthday boy, Mark Telercio, our executive producer and king of all things web. And we are very grateful for our distribution company called Odyssey. We are mostly grateful for you guys because you make this whole show. So try to lift each other up, change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow. 